All right, well, as you are all filing in, I will take the opportunity to say hello. My name is Sharis Kubrin. I'm a professor in criminology, law, and society. Very pleased to be here today and have enjoyed all the panels uh, immensely. Um, we've got an excellent afternoon set of panels, which I think will be started off with our stellar panel on police accountability. And I will reiterate what a former chair said, which is that please go online to look at the extensive bios of our speakers. They're all there available as well as the abstract. I'm just going to do a quick one sentence intro for all of our speakers. It won't do it justice, so please check out their full bios online. So um, first we will have a presentation by Erwin Chemerensky, um, who is the founding dean, distinguished professor of law, and the Raymond Pryke Professor of First Amendment Law here at UCI. That will be followed by Carol Saron, who is a professor in the Department of Criminology, Law, and Society, also here at UC Irvine. She holds courtesy appointments in the Department of Sociology as well as the School of Law. That will be followed by a presentation by Samuel Walker, who is Professor Emeritus of Criminal Justice at the University of Nebraska at, Ho at Omaha. And we will round out the panel with comments by Merrick Bob, who is President and Executive Director at Police Assessment Resource Center. So I think we'll get going right away. Um, we'll have our first presentation by Dean Chemerinsky. It's an honor to be asked to speak here this afternoon. The Los Angeles Police Department has changed dramatically for the better over the last 15 years. It's not a perfect department, but there's no doubt that there have been major reforms. The question that I want to focus on, what caused those reforms to happen and what lessons can be learned from them? I think to a large extent, the catalyst for the reforms were the exposing of the Rampart scandal in the spring of 2000. You might remember that what occurred was a police officer, Rafael Perez, was caught substituting flour for drugs in the police locker room. He was prosecuted for this. There was a hung jury. He then offered a plea deal before the retrial. He said in exchange for reduction of charges and sentences, he would tell of a major scandal within the department. He was in what was known as the Rampart Crash Anti-Gang Unit. Rampart is a neighborhood in Los Angeles in the east part of the city. He said there were regularly instances of officers planting drugs on innocent people and lying to gain convictions. To give one example, a man by the name of Javier Avando, Perez and his partner Nino Durden got in a verbal altercation with Javier Avando. They then shot Avando. They planted a gun on Avando and said that Avando would threaten them. On the morning of trial, they changed their story. They lied. Avando was convicted. He was sentenced to 24 years in prison. The judge imposed the sentence in part by saying that Avando had showed no remorse. One of the things that Perez told the investigators was that this story was untrue, that Avando didn't have a gun. In the spring of, of the year 2000, a board of inquiry for the Los Angeles Police Department issued a report it minimized the nature of the Rampart scandal. It said it was largely a result of just a few bad apples. At this time, I received a call from the then head of the Police Protective League, Ted Hunt, and asked if I would be willing to do a study of the Board of Inquiry report and look at the Los Angeles Police Department in light of the Rampart scandal. I think the reason he had come to me was I had just finished a two-year term as the chair of the elected Los Angeles Charter Reform Commission, and part of what we had done was look at the LAPD. I said no to Mr. Hunt. The Los Angeles Police Protective League, for me, had long been the opposite of the things that I believed in in terms of police reform. He had a number of people call me over the next couple of days to implore me to do this and to say that it was an opportunity to really make a difference with regard to the Los Angeles Police Department. I said I had three conditions for doing this. First that I could say anything I wanted. The report would be mine, not that of the Police Protective League. They would have no opportunity to review the report before it's done. Second, I could work with whoever I wanted. And third, that the report would immediately be public at the same time that I would give it to the Police Protective League, I would give it to the mayor, the city attorney, the city council. He agreed to all of those conditions. I recruited five terrific individuals to work with me. 
civil rights lawyers, Connie Rice, Carol Sobel, Paul Hoffman, and Sam Paz, and law professor Lori Levinson. Hunt gave me only one condition in exchange. He wanted the report done within six months. And so this is in March of 2000, and we issued the report, ironically, on September 11th of 2000. Over the course of these six months, I had the chance to interview over 75 police officers. I talked to those who were in the command staff at the time and earlier in the LAPD. I talked to judges and former judges, former prosecutors, current prosecutors, former defense lawyers, and current defense lawyers. Issued a report that was almost 200 pages that made about 50 recommendations. Discovered that there was what every report on the LAPD had found serious problems in the very culture of the department. In fact, when the Christopher Commission issued its report, something much discussed in the last session, it talked about the central problem with the Los Angeles Police Department being the culture. In fact, what I observed was a cycle that was constantly repeating itself. There would be a scandal, there would be an investigation, report recommendations. Some of the recommendations would be adopted, most would be ignored. Victory would be declared over the problem only until there was another scandal and the cycle repeated itself. One of the key problems that we saw with regard to the culture in the Los Angeles Police Department was the code of silence. Many officers told me personally they felt that if they reported misconduct by other officers, they felt that they might suffer reprisals, either in terms of harassment and discipline within the department, or the next time they were in trouble in the field, no one would be there to watch their back. My colleague Connie Rice described the culture as one that exalted Dirty Harry and shunted Serpico. We reported on what we saw as serious problems with regard to the disciplinary system in the Los Angeles Police Department. We saw this at every stage with regard to the disciplinary system. There were problems in terms of receiving complaints against officers. We heard that those who wanted to file complaints often didn't know where to go. They often were met with a stone wall. We saw problems in investigating complaints against officers. Especially at this time, officers would go into internal affairs, would often do so for a short period of time on the way up the hierarchy. Above all, their thinking was to make no waves. We saw problems with regard to the Board of Rights. And we saw a real need for a Board of Rights that would have much more credibility with regard to the community. We proposed, for example, that the Board of Rights include one member from the command staff one person from the level of sergeant two or higher, and one civilian. That was something that proposed during charter reform. We gave serious consideration to an entirely civilian Board of Rights. And one of the things that I was most stunned to learn was that there was no system for effectively tracking the disciplinary records of officers. We looked carefully at the protocol with regard to officers involved shooting and saw deficiencies within it, a protocol that often let officers talk with each other before it they would then ultimately present their story. We also looked at other problems in the criminal justice system in Los Angeles. We saw the difficulty in requiring that prosecutors be the one for discipline prosecuting officers. Prosecutors depend on a daily basis for the officers for the cases that they're preparing. We saw a real conflict of their being the ones to investigate wrongdoing. We saw that judges felt intimidated by the possibility of what's called being papered if they seem tough on the police. Under California law, under section 170.6, each side in a case can challenge a judge and have the judge excused without giving a reason. Judges felt that if they stood up to the police and prosecutors, they wouldn't get papered and taken off criminal cases. It's ironic to read what I wrote back in 2000 to now look what's gone on in Orange County, where after a judge found misconduct by an assistant district attorney, the district attorney's office papered that judge in 55 out of 58 murder cases in a 16-month period, an issue that I hope the California Supreme Court will soon take up, one where I'm involved as a lawyer for the Superior Court of Orange County. We made extensive recommendations. Almost all of what we recommended came to be adopted. Some of the things we proposed weren't adopted. I still believe there needs to be more whistleblower protection in the Los Angeles Police Department. When I was at the University of Southern California, which is where I was when I did this report, one day an officer came into my office, closed the door, and of course my first fear was something that happened to one of my children. And the officer told me of something that was illegal that was going on in his station house and when going on, he knew of it about six months. 
And he said, who can I tell where I won't face discipline for not having reported this earlier? And who can I tell where we remain anonymous as long as possible because I'm fear of reprisals? With the officer sitting in my office, I called the then Inspector General, Jeff Eglash, and Jeff Eglish said, and it was over the speakerphone, that he didn't feel there was anybody that the officer could talk to with that assurance. We proposed a full-time professional police commission. Under the Los Angeles City Charter, the police commission manages the department, but the police commission of part-time, and many commissioners told me, told me they didn't feel that that was adequate to be able to, to do the job. Um, we also proposed that there really be changes with regard to things like 170.6, which require a change in state law to judges from being intimidated if they stand up to police and prosecutors. Yet overall, the recommendations we proposed were adopted. And why was that? How did that come to be? Well, I think most of all it came to be because of some courageous individuals. Um, but let me identify three things in this regard. First, the changes came to be because of the consent decree that reformed the Los Angeles Police Department. The then assistant, acting assistant attorney general of the United States, Bill Lan Lee, sent a letter to the city saying that the Justice Department was prepared to prosecute for a pattern and practice of excess of force and violations of the Fourth Amendment. A team was launched to negotiate a consent decree. Jerry Chaliff, who is here, is one of the individuals who did so. And they did a magnificent job. The consent decree brought about so many of the essential reforms Give one example, it created the system for tracking disciplinary violations of officers. But here, too, it took some courage for this to come about. Under Los Angeles City Charter, a consent decree has to be approved by the city council. But like any city council action, it can be vetoed by the mayor. And the then mayor, Richard Reardon, who I believe was no friend of police reform, decided that he was likely to veto the consent decree. The city council president, John Ferraro, who at the time was dying of cancer, stood up and organized to make sure that there were the votes that made clear that a mayoral veto would be overridden and the consent decree came into effect. There wouldn't be reform of the LAPD without it. Second, it took, I think, an outsider to be police chief to bring about the changes. And here, too, it took a real act of political courage. James Hahn was then the mayor of Los Angeles. If you know anything about Los Angeles history, you know, that Han was elected in large part because of support from the African American community. His father, Kenneth Han, was a longtime member of the County Board of Supervisors who represented South Los Angeles. The chief of police at the time was Bernard Parks. In many ways, I would be praising of Chief Parks. I think he did a great deal to change the racism of the Los Angeles Police Department. But Parks was very much from the culture of the LAPD. He told me directly to my face that I had no right to criticize the Los Angeles Police Department until I stood up to the bullets. That cannot be right in terms of the ability to oversee any military or paramilitary organization. And so Jim Hahn made the choice to replace Bernard Parks and to bring in Chief William Bratton. I think it was predictable at the time that that would cost Hahn the support of the African American community when he ran for reelection. It did. He lost his re-election bid. But bringing in an outsider, Bratton, made all the difference in terms of changing the culture of the Los Angeles Police Department. In thir third, it took the cooperation of the rank and file of the department to bring about changes. When Parks was the chief, there was tremendous tension between him and the rank and file. They perceived especially that his discipline was arbitrary and sometimes capricious. The leaders of the Police Protective League left instructions that if they died in the line of duty, they didn't want Chief Parks to come to their funeral, which I understand is as much in your face as you can get in the context of police culture. Chief Branton worked very hard with the rank and file to change the department, to bring about things like community policing, to bring into the department people like Connie Rice and Jerry Chaliff, constitutional policing advisors. And so I don't mean to present the LAPD as a perfect department. There's still problems. But if I had more time, I think I could detail all of the ways in which it's changed over the last 15 years. And the lessons that I draw from this is that if there is a troubled department, there's no doubt the LAPD was, it takes both outside and inside action to reform it. These changes wouldn't have occurred but for the consent decree, but for Chief Bratton but it also wouldn't have worked without the support of the rank and file.
Thank you. Some years ago, I, I had to speak after Justice O'Connor, and um, I was reminded of that as I was sitting here thinking I had to speak after Chief Beck and Erwin Chimerinsky, <laughs> who doesn't ever have a piece of paper in front of him, <laughs> ever. So while they're getting this set up, um, I am going to be talking about some research that I did many years ago, actually now, when I lived in New York, and sadly, the research is still quite relevant. Um, I was asked by a member of the Civilian Complaint Review Board in New York City to um, conduct a study of the public's perceptions of police misconduct. And it, it was actually around the time of the Amo Diallo case, which some of you may know is, was one of the horrific cases in uh, uh, that occurred in, this, in uh, New York City. And it's important to note that uh, in light of some of the findings that I'm going to be talking about. There's been a great deal of talk um, around uh, issues of police accountability, and we've also spent a great deal of time today talking about um, police misconduct around the use of force. And while those are incredibly important, my research actually focuses on some of those lower level encounters that was, were pointed out, uh, that were alluded to earlier, and the impact of those kinds of encounters on people's perceptions of police misconduct. Um, and where this research began was my, by my reading hundreds of files of cases that individuals had presented to the Civilian Complaint Review Board in New York. Um, and if any of you have read through or had the privilege of looking at these files, I can tell you that they're chock-a-block full with uh, allegations of police officers using incredibly vulgar uh, language and ethnic slurs, and, and in large part, that's fair amount about uh, that becomes an important ingredient in this in this uh, in this particular re research. So to be sure, there were incidences of filings of uh, uh, alleged use of force, um, but equally important, these descriptions from individuals around the city of New York included. Uh, allegations of other forms of police misconduct often focused around discourtesy and abusive language. Um, while we didn't focus on this, I'll just make a, a sidebar comment. Later we went back and tried to code the, them themselves for when, and another point that you should know actually is, is that most of these filings were uh, of alleged misconduct were not found um, to have were not confirmed by the administrative process in the city of New York. And in the rare instances where it occurred, it often requires a corroborating witness who is legitimate, to come back to that word. And often in these settings, there is not necessarily a legitimate uh, witness to be seen. So this research, uh, uh, and I, uh, the way I'm framing this research is also to look at the perceptions of police officers and civilians. And we come back again to the name that Chuck Epp mentioned earlier. Jim Fife was the head of the police academy at the time that I was doing this research, and it was through him that I was able to uh, administer, replicate this same project with a group of police officers, and um, the, there was a telephone survey to a population in the city of New York. So there were three questions that motivated this research. How do citizens form judgments around the, uh, these types of encounters that are filed in the Civilian Complaint Review Board? How harshly do they believe that officers should be punished for these types of allegations? And how do the judgments and the level of punishment compare between civilians and police officers? These two questions. So the type of study, I'm not gonna go into this at all, I'm happy to answer questions later, is called a factorial survey design. Uh, it's a pretty esoteric form of survey research. And um, what it entails is a fairly complicated set of experimental manipulations within each survey. And each respondent, both civilians and uh, police officers, 
were asked to read about 15 of these kinds of vignettes, and then they were asked to question. So this is a typical one. This is a pretty mild one, actually. I should have made it a little bit more, uh, 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 more forceful in its language. A police officer stops an African-American male teen because a bulge in his waist might be a gun. The civilian demands to know why he is being stopped and repeatedly yells at the officer, I know my rights. The police officer yells, calls the teen a fecking wise ass. The teen attempts to leave the scene. Later, the police officer slaps the teen with an open hand and the teen physically resists the police officer. Later, the police officer said that he found the, the young man completely disrespectful. You should know that all of these types of allegations were actually drawn from the reports themselves. That's where we got the material for the survey. And following each vignette, a respondent was asked two questions on a scale of 0 to 10. How serious is the police misconduct? And what should the level of punishment be, from no punishment to some level of jail time? So. Um, as we go through these findings and think about it, I think one way that's useful to think about these findings um, is to imagine that the jury, that the police officers and the citizens are in a jury room and they're weighing the evidence and they're trying to reach a consensus about an appropriate level of discipline for the officer in this particular, in this setting. And as I'll show in a minute, you can think about this along two dimensions. First, you can think about it in terms of the level of discipline that the officer should receive, the level of um, the seriousness of the, finding, of the, of the um, misconduct that's described in the vignette. And this set of findings is not particularly surprising. Citizens, uh, regardless of race, were significantly more likely to rate the level of seriousness of misconduct higher than police officers. Not particularly a surprising finding, um, whereas on average police officers rated all of these vignettes, some of them which got much more um, juicy, shall we say, than the one that I showed, shared with you, the appropriate level of discipline was no punishment or, to a written warning in 64% of these thousands of cases. On averages, citizens uh, were more in the range of um, a written warning to loss of vacation. And what's interesting about this is this happened in the context of the Diallo incident, and there was no significant difference, there was not a significant difference among citizens between whites and blacks. So that's a, that's a pretty counterintuitive finding that there was that level of consensus in the judgment, given what we know about the ways in which judgments in the criminal justice system generally fall out. But what's also interesting about the research is that you can, you can analyze these vignettes, both in terms of the outcome, the seriousness and the punishment, but also the factors in the stories that are significant in weighing and reaching that conclusion. I'm not going to explain to you how that we can do that, but you'll just have to trust me on it that we can do it. And basically, if you go back to that analogy of the jury, what we find is, is that across the vignettes, the most important dimensions in these stories are the presence of the unnecessary use of force and whether the civilian was in, injured. And then for civilians, what remains salient is um, discourtesy, offensive language, racial epitaphs. So if you think about this as a jury, what has happened is that they've agreed on which evidence is important, which evidence is salient, but they diametrically opposed in what is the appropriate level of punishment, what should be done based upon the evidence that they've received. OK, I think I'll make it. So there's a number of messages that I think, findings that I think emerge from this research. First. There are significant differences in the levels of discipline meted out by police officers and citizens. And while black and Hispanic tend, there's some tendency for them to be a bit more punitive than whites at the upper end of the scale, the overall picture is one of consensus among citizens. In contrast to an enormous body of research, this is, I think, an important piece of the findings. 
Further, the findings do not demonstrate that citizens are saying, let's put these prison, let's remove these officers from the force, let's put them in jail um, or prison. Uh, we use the word jail in the survey, though they would actually be incarcerated. Um, but rather, what they're saying is that they expect some level of discipline for abusive encounters. And I think this goes back to a point that Christy Lopez made earlier, that we need to develop some understanding of an appropriate level of discipline for officers. And that's what I think these findings show that citizens expect. Um, I think the other, there, I'm gonna skip this because I made this point already. Um, another theme that I think emerges from this research is what to make of this discour discourtesy and offensive language? What are we to make of these, reported, these repeated filings among generally African-American men? That was kind of what the impetus of this re research was, an uptick in filings by African-Americans, in the men in the city of New York. Um, what are we to make of the important, the, the emphasis that citizens place upon the use of offensive language. This was actually called the motherfucker study by the survey research term team that uh, did the, conducted the, the research for me. Um, in the context of the unnecessary use of force. Force is obviously much more serious. Why is it that language still remains salient? It, in citizens' judgments about police misconduct. Now, I'm basically a student of the professions. That's what I've spent most of my career studying, lawyers, judges, engineers. And I think it comes down to a really simple point. And that is that we expect police officers, when they put on that uniform, they are professionals. We don't go to the dentist and expect our dentist to use vulgar language. We don't talk to a lawyer and expect them to use vulgar language. We don't, as a professor, we don't use vulgar language. <laughs> right? <laughs> Unless we're making a point. <laughs> but we expect the same thing of our police officers. They are, we see them as professionals. They are a symbol of governance. And we have a collective sense of what we expect from them. So it's a really simple policy change that police could make to improve co police community relations, and that is just to zip your mouth. Fourth, um, and, and the final point is that I think what this research shows is, is that it contributes to an, what we mean by the community's understanding for an appropriate level of discipline for an officer who engages in misconduct. That misconduct is not just related to the misuse of force or the, the misuse of force, but also includes courtesy and language. Um, so I'll leave it at that, and perhaps we can come back and talk about it further. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's been an outstanding conference so far. Uh, I really want to thank the organizers for allowing me to be a part of it. And it's also an honor for me to be on the, share the podium with Merrick Bob, who is the foremost expert on police accountability in this country, bar none. So it's a great privilege for me. Uh, we, have, we, have, we have two deans. We got the dean of the law school and we got the dean of police accountability, all, all in one place. Yeah. Uh, we're at an unprecedented moment in uh, American police history. I would amend Wes Gogan's opening remarks uh, of this morning only by saying I really think this is unique. I think it's very different from other, other crises. It's not just another chapter in an ongoing story. Uh, the President's task force was, was the first ever commission or task force, presidential level, devoted exclusively to the police. 
uh, had never happened before. And because of all the public attention, we have an extraordinary opportunity for reform. And the question is, will we seize that moment? Will we seize that moment or will it slip past? And will we have to start over again uh, somehow? Uh, and actually, I'm, I'm, when I was young, I used to be a cynic. Uh, now that I'm older, I'm, you know, sort of mellowing a little bit. And I'm actually guardedly optimistic about, uh, guardedly, underlying guardedly, uh, bold face, um, about the, the changes that are in fact already happening and the conceptualization of, of, of the rethinking of, of police. So uh, life moves on. My argument is that police officer use of force reports are the core element. They are the linchpin in accountability. And I'm going to explain why and, and where, the, where, they, uh, where they fit in. Um, the standard, <clears throat> which we have courtesy of uh, Christy Lopez and her colleagues uh, at the uh, special litigation section, is that after a force incident, deadly force, physical force, the officer will complete a report by the end of the shift. And that report will be complete and it will be accurate and the sergeant will review that report, demand more detail where necessary, demand that ambiguities be unresolved, and then forward that on up the chain of command uh, uh, with the appropriate uh, comment. Uh, if you read the, the DOJ findings letters for Cleveland and, and some of the other cities, you find out that in many cases, officers do not complete reports at all. Uh, the, the reports are fiction. They're novel, they're short stories. Uh, they bear no relationship to the facts of what happened, and sergeants just routinely sign them and, and send them on up. So this, this is, is the, 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 you know, the key, in my mind, to accountability. Uh, this is a conference on race and policing. Where does race factor into this? All police issues are related to race, every single one. Wes said more or less that uh, this morning, and I agree with it. Uh, you cannot, maybe you know, choosing you know what model to buy for for patrol cars is, doesn't implicate race, but everything else in policing does. Uh, so, um, the concerns of this of my my presentation uh, it's really conceptual and and strategic. It's how we think about what we're doing, and the we there is is a uh, sort of the collective we. All of those. All of us in our various walks of life who are working to achieve a policing that is professional, that is respectful, that is free of bias. That is what we want uh, in, oh yes, and legal and constitutional, forgot that. Uh, we, want, we want the best possible policing. Um, the, and as I was preparing this and, and writing it, uh, I was very, very aware that I have two audiences. One is the professional audience, which includes many of us in this room, people who know an awful lot about, about policing and, and police accountability. But I think by the, really, the group I'm really talking to are the community groups. Um, and, and because my concern is, is I, want, I want community people who, who, are, who are protesting and who are making demands to have a clear set of goals and, and, and a strategy involving really evidence-based uh, proposals on how to improve policing. Uh, this morning, uh, Lisa Dogard told me uh, a truly astonishing uh, incident. Is Lisa still here? Lisa, uh, they were, there she is in the back. Uh, you were meeting, a group was meeting and, and uh, what to do about you know, police problems and well, they couldn't agree on whether or not there were problems and then somebody called your bluff and said, well, all right, uh, what would you want? And you said, well, you were at a loss. You didn't know. My goal, my goal my, is to make sure that that kind of incident never happens again. I want people who are, who are working for police reform to have a, a clear and specific set of goals about things that, are, that are, will get the job done and which, which can be uh, achieved. Uh, I'm, I also want to say that uh, in terms of my, my concern with, uh, with you know, the community audience, uh, I believe in protests. I really do. Uh, uh, my, and that's been in part because of my personal history. When I was a college student in 1964, 
you can do the arithmetic and figure out how old I am. Uh, I was a student at the University of Michigan. I went to Mississippi for the summer in what is Freedom Summer for the, to work for the right to vote in Mississippi. It was an event that changed my life. It's been a North Star ever since. And protests have, have made change happen. Uh, uh, had there been no protests after Ferguson, and all the other events. Had there been, had the, the shootings and deaths uh, occurred and there had been no protests, I don't think we'd be here. The president certainly wouldn't have, wouldn't have appointed a, a task force. The protests create the, the, the public awareness and the demand for reform. So with that, I'm gonna plunge in on my uh, contribution. Uh, let's look at the, you know, the, the reform agenda of, of, of people who are demanding reform. Uh, let, I want to focus, because time is short, I want to focus on the first three. I want to criminal prosecution of officers who shoot people. Uh, I want, that is, and especially in the case of Ferguson, implicated, you know, grand jury reform. There's been a call for independent investigations of shooting incidents and independent prosecutions where the evidence stands, uh, supports it. But let's think about it. You know, Though that's actually a fairly small number of incidents. Don't mistake me, don't mis misunderstand me. Yes, they're important, but it's, it's a tiny fraction of what goes on in policing. The BJS Police Public Contact Survey says there are 63 million police public contacts every year. Well, uh, my concern is let's, let's intervene earlier and touch upon those millions and millions of, of contacts. And one of the best places we can do it is, is at the, through the uh, use of force uh, uh, incidents. We could talk about others like citizen oversight. Okay, but if somebody files a complaint, I mean, that's, that's a, a tiny fraction of all, of all the bad incidents that occur. So again, it, it, it's, 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 it's a good idea. Uh, it has its place, we, do, we, need, we need it, but it's not getting at, at the, the, uh, the, really the core element. Now, by contrast, these officer use of force reports implicate everything in the department. So especially the officer, and so in a place like Cleveland, for the first time in that police department, officers will have to account for what they did. And they will have to account for it in detail in a complete and honest report. The, that will be something new in not just uh, Cleveland, but a lot of other uh, cities. The sergeant will have to do something that the sergeant was not accustomed to doing, which was critically evaluate that officer's initial report and to demand more detail, demand that ambiguities be clarified, uh, and so on. The witness officers, they will have to give honest accounts of what they witnessed, what they saw. You know, there's this outrageous situation in Chicago, the Laquan McDonald uh, shooting. The police union representative showed up right away and said, suspect lunged at the officer with a knife. A lie. And the witness officers all filed reports saying, suspect lunged at the officer with a knife. That kind of stuff has got to stop. And so if we, if we make progress on this particular area, uh, it will, two minutes. Uh, let's see, I think we're gonna make it. The, the question is, how do we get from here to there? Now, where you have a consent decree, there is a court-appointed monitor, Mr. Bob, uh, uh, and, and you have a, you know, a lawful court order. They, they've got to do it, and there are penalties if they don't do it. But what about the rest uh, of, of the police departments? The solution is a form of citizen oversight, variously called inspector general or police auditor, where you have you know, an inspector general and a team of investigators uh, that have full authority to investigate anything and everything within that police department. And one of their tasks should be to make sure that officers are in fact on a regular basis filling out complete use of force reports that, that are complete and, and are honest. Uh, that is, is, is the, 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 the permanent solution. Even in the case of, of consent decrees, um, you know, at some point, you know, well, maybe not in Oakland, but uh, it's an in-joke for people familiar with the o Oakland <laughs> situation. Uh, the 
department will be deemed in compliance and, and the consent decree will go away and the monitor will go away and the judge will go away. So what? Then that department's on its own. That city is on its own. And so the way to ensure the continuity is to have this, this independent outside body with a full authority to investigate everything, which can then monitor whether or not the, the, the policy of, of full and complete officer reports uh, is being done. Thank you.